So welcome everyone. We have a lot more people than actually anticipated. So we're going to try to make the best use of everyone's time here. I'm John Nellen, founder and CEO. Excited to be joined by Patrick Orzakowski. So he's our VP of Security Research and Intelligence. He just joined about two months ago now. So I'll let you in introduce yourself in a second. Also joined by Aaron Goldstein, our head of security operations and IR. Most of you know him as he, he runs our MXDR program here at Total. And of course, Brent Murphy, head of detection engineering. Um, so today, lots, you can see the agenda items up here. Um, we're going to discuss a number of things around really 2020 predictions uh, for the threat landscape and then wrap up with some exciting updates. So full 60 minutes today. Please make sure to use the Q&A within Zoom so we can answer all the questions. We'll be doing so on the fly. We want to keep this very open, very loose. So if something's on your mind, if you don't understand something, just let us know and we'll try to address it in real time as we go through. Uh, why don't we kick it off? Patrick, you want to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, John. Yeah, Patrick Wozniakowski. Uh, as John mentioned, I just joined uh, Total about two months ago. Uh, I came from DeepWatch where I was one of the uh, co-founding employees uh, for seven years. So built an MDR uh, for DeepWatch, more focused on the enterprise um, the, the last seven years. Prior to that, I spent about 15 years as a practitioner in cybersecurity. Uh, started out on the blue team side uh, in the defense contracting industry, uh, chasing APTs uh, like Titan Rain back in the mid 2000s. Yeah, yeah. Um, we were one of the first to catch those and, and really opened our eyes to what the attackers were doing. Um, then I went on the red team side. Right. So I was lucky enough to uh, to pen test uh, some systems for the intelligence community, uh, satellite systems, breaking into those, and then you know entered the startup world with DeepWatch and super excited to be here at Total. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think one of the things that you know really jumped out about your background is you spent some time at Verizon, right? Weren't you doing like- TW Telecom. TW Telecom, yep. right? Kind of like sampling some internet backbone traffic, looking for patterns and trends of threat activity. Yeah, absolutely. So looking at the, the global aspect of threat actors, right? So we sampled one out of every 2048 packet uh, awesome. going over yeah. the TW Telecom and level three backbone, um, which translated to about five to 10 terabytes a day of, of traffic. So we were able to um, build Black Lotus Labs, uh, okay. which is still there under the Lumen flag. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, really exciting uh, research there and, and looking to continue that here with Total with all the data that we have. Yeah, yeah. No, a lot of exciting stuff you've been working on and looking forward to getting to that. Um, so why don't we just jump right in um, to what's going on here? So what are we seeing in the wild, Patrick? So in the two months you've been here, seeing patterns, trends, like what's happening? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, uh, one of the one of the big things uh, that we uncovered was looking at advanced attack techniques. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not just for the Fortune 500s or large government organizations anymore. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, C2, advanced C2, like Cobalt Strike uh, being used in the wild. Um, to attack uh, small and medium-sized businesses, right? Not just the Fortune 500s. Um, the blog post that's out there that was from about a week and a half ago uh, in ICE ID, uh, we saw an ICE ID uh, uh, malware attempt against a customer. Um, it wasn't the traditional phishing. So Proofpoint a week earlier had put out uh, a blog post about uh, phishing with ISO files that are in password zipped. Yeah. Um, this was actually part of a parked domain phishing attempt. Okay. Um, so misclick or mistype to www-irs-gov okay. would take you to this malicious site, download uh, an exe that was part of a PDF um, link, and uh, that would execute on your system. And you know this is a, a new version of the ICE ID campaign right. that Emotad is using. Okay. Um, so you know seeing more advanced attacks uh, coming down the pike, right? Yeah. Um, also, you know, living off the land, using PowerShell, and Brent will show a demo right. of, of using PowerShell um, that doesn't really drop anything on a system, right? Um, the, the attackers are using, they love red team tools, right? right? The C2 is Cobalt Strike, um, Mimikat, Empire PowerShell, those things that are living off the land on a system for, uh, lateral movement. Yeah, you know, uh, we're seeing a ton of that activity uh, coming down. You know, from 
what we see in red teams, what we see right. in advanced attackers against Fortune 500s yeah. being commoditized and using as a service right. down to small and medium-sized businesses. It's super interesting. And just for everyone, you know, we, we put out what we call a, a Fintel or like a, a finished Intel report on Iced ID. Um, we were the first to actually discover the new TTP and, you know, Patrick and his team uh, watch them for a while. So if, if Zach, maybe you can put that link so everyone could just download it at some point if they want to see it. But I guess my question to you, Patrick, is, you know, why is this interesting? So it's been known for a while, right, that, um, you know, more of the, the enterprise strategies from these threat actors are coming downstream. Why do you think suddenly that's happening? Like, for example, rewinding the clock two, three years ago, right, would have would it have been just too much effort, too difficult to execute with this level of sophistication? Is it automation that's helping them? Absolutely. Okay, so yeah. you want to just talk through that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, we could go back to the solar winds attack. Okay. Right? Um, looking at at scale as a service, right? Yeah. Malicious activity. Uh, prior to maybe three to five years ago, um, we were seeing targeted attacks, right? Mm -hmm. You would target a large bank. Right. You would target a large manufacturer. Um, now they target software distributors, right. right? So, you know, looking at SolarWinds, it, it wasn't just attacking a company like SolarWinds, it was attacking them and their customers. Of course, yeah. And yeah. doing that at scale, automating, using infrastructure as a service, right? Yeah. I mean, we saw with the Iced ID campaign, how quickly they stood everything up. Yeah. They had the domains going, they had their IP addresses going. And then as soon as someone uploaded a sample yeah. of virus total, boom, they burned it down. And you know, in a matter of hours. Yeah. And Zach, if you could jump to that next slide, I, I think, right? Do we have kind of the breakdown on Iced ID, right, of, of what we were seeing here? Yeah. So this is some of the some of the TTPs that we released and and some of the timeline. Uh, uh, you know, things of note here is that you know the the initial infection mechanism um, was pointed to by a whole bunch of different domains. Yeah. Uh, that's what hosted that EXE. Um, that used the self-signed cert, right? It was right. in Russia. Um, you know, for example, our, our SASE products could potentially block going to Russia. They could potentially block going yeah. to self-signed. Well, sites. it's the control depth, yeah. right? Because you have, you know, in the next gen firewall, you have the ability to, to block geos based on IPs, right? When you look at proxy, if you has, have SSL inspection on, it's going to block those self-signed by the fall, right? And that, you know, kind of looking at the TTPs here really highlights the need for the defense and depth aspect of it, right? Absolutely. Just looking at the endpoint yeah. wouldn't have been enough to understand what was going on if you were to get infected. Right further than than where they got with our customer. And more importantly, it could have prevented some of it too. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, those those products that aren't just focusing on the endpoint, that aren't just focusing on the network, that focus holistically on visibility, right. are really key to to thwarting these advanced attacks. Do you, do you see the advanced attacks changing to kind of take advantage of gaps and controls? Do you believe that kind of the evolution, the path they're going in? So like PowerShell, for example, living off the land, living in memory, right? Is that just another tactic of evasion of the existing security controls that most people are using and companies are using? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it, it's seems like every time we set the bar, you know, the, 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 the bad folks jump right over it. Um, you know, we saw it with next gen antivirus, yeah. next gen firewall, um, and then EDR, right? Um, you know, EDR is, is is not a panacea. It's not it's not right. a silver bullet. Um, and, you know, if you go to the hacker com conferences and have conversations on Discord, you know, the, the red teams are constantly bypassing ADR. Like sure. that's, yeah. that's their main goal is to, you right. know, you have CrowdStrike, you have, you know, and Sentinel one on a system, yeah. you want to bypass that sure. in a pen test. And what, what did they do? They released their research and yeah. then the bad actors use those red team tools yeah. to, to do malicious activity. The, the, the pendulum has swung almost too much, right? Because, you know, if you rewind 10 years, everything was focused on perimeter, this right edge, then the pendulum swung to everything needs to live on the endpoint. Mm -hmm. And now XDR is like this evolution of endpoint by the vendors who are looking to kind of expand their capabilities. But, you know, it, it's it's really a big miss on the full control set to be able to address it, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really comes back to fundamentals, right? The SOC, right. The SOC triad, 
Um, you know, I would actually add a couple couple legs to the stool there. <laughs> um, cloud cloud data, right? Sure. Office 365 is critical. Yeah. AWS data, Azure data is critical. Right. Um, because you don't have that kind of traditional data center visibility that you could do packet capture and deep packet inspection on. Right. right? So you know, add add to endpoint network and then sim yeah add your cloud and sure. any other SaaS products out there right if you yeah. move to an octa if you move to an azure ad right you don't have that endpoint visibility anymore because it's hosted in a SaaS product right so you're you're beholden to them to send the logs to your sim totally so you really can't get that visibility unless you have the full the full picture and the other thing that jumps out here is you know I would say that these threat actors were more brazen than perhaps they've been in the past, right? Using public cloud services, DigitalOcean, things like these weren't, you know, bulletproof hosting IPs from Russia, right? We're not sure who to attribute this to, so don't interpret that as an attribution. But just saying, whoever the, the threat actor group is, right? There's there wasn't much concern for you know using large public companies to do. Is that a fair statement, or do you think that's no? That's that's completely fair, and you know as. I think as we looked at their their C2 and, and additional you know geolocations, yeah. right, they started using Let's Encrypt. They started using right. um, you know uh, more legitimate looking domains yeah. uh, for C2. So you know a, as the the initial kind of infection mechanism seems to be spray and pray. Right. Right. It's it's whether a giant phishing campaign yep. or uh, you know uh, whoever downloads this looking like DNS talk to right. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and then and then they establish those footholds right. using live off the land, lateral movement, and then they deploy whatever they want to deploy, destructive ransomware, ransomware as a service, right. you know, um, or, you know, steal data yeah. and, and potentially ransom that. So, you know, it's it, the tools that they're using are very advanced tools, right? They and can, it's enabling them to move really fast. Yes. Because as, as soon as they got popped, right? As soon as they were recognized, as soon as it hit virus total, they were gone in a matter of hours, Yeah. right? Yeah. And cool. there has to be significant automation. There has to be, they're probably using a lot of the same tactics and strategies that, you know, most enterprise DevOps teams are using, right? Absolutely. In order to automate, cut down on time to deploy and everything else. And there's something else you notice too, is almost that they're rebuilding whatever the malware payload was overnight. So they keep yeah. the hash changing, right? So yeah. definitely like pipe automation pipelines, all sorts of, you know, very interesting, you know, operational uh, aspects yeah. to this, yeah, and and the EXEs were signed by by a certificate authority in Poland. They right, were, they were legitimate. Yeah, that's the other thing too. EXEs, yeah, that they used the certificate authority to right. to sign. So, you know, Brent Brent will show uh, some some demos about uh, how how we do that and how to bypass some some endpoint protections. But, you know, it just the the capabilities and the advancement of of these attackers that aren't you know, traditional nation state, right? right. They, they they have budgets now. I'm sure they have <laughs> development budgets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and uh, capabilities and roadmaps. Yeah. Right. They're they're reusing code that maybe was uh, you know an APT in the past. Sure. They look at that code, they advance it, and right. then they, like I said, move around, jump over the bar. They yeah. they, they get around our defenses. And and yeah. they brought back a lot of domains that you know previously may have been in use, right? As the other yeah. thing too. So they're aware that in you know the Intel land, like a lot of these IOCs, they phase out over time. They get dropped from different feeds, but they'll hang on to them. And we saw this interesting pattern of them actually jumping to different registrars. <laughs> right with the different domains that they had and then reusing them a few years later right yeah yeah i think the actors have realized that threat and, intel is ephemeral right, right. It's, it's very short lived yeah. because if you keep a if you keep a database of every ip address that's ever been malicious you're going right. to block half the internet right well, because so. of all the cloud services and the recycling of ipv4 but what's interesting about the dns and the host name reuse is that you know a lot of a lot of controls rely on the age of the DNS, yeah. right? Of the age of the entry, like block entries that are less than 60, 90. Some of these have been, were years old though, Yeah. right? Yeah. So, so, you know, defenses along those lines, it just shows that they're working to circumvent a lot of the controls and a lot of the thinking on the defense side of things in very interesting ways. Aaron, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Are you going to yeah. say something? 
Oh, yeah. So I was just going to say um, that, you know, while there are some some really advanced tactics here, a lot of times these threat actors, in fact, in the situation that we saw with Iced ID here, um, they're not always necessarily bypassing EDR and coming up with these, you know, fancy zero days. Yeah. Oftentimes, they're also just exploiting configuration misconfigurations. Um, okay. So in, in some cases, EDR was in detect mode, but not block mode, or perhaps mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, a partner isn't familiar with all of the features of, of other third party EDR tools and isn't prevent, um, protecting things uh, as easily with, as with our module. So um, in some cases, it's, it's not necessarily, uh, you can have all the tools under the sun, but they have to be configured properly to you know, uh, prevent these types of things. Cool. And I think Brent, so Brent put together an example of, you know, right on, on the PowerShell side of things, Brent, do, do you want to talk on that a little bit just so we can maybe, you know, yeah. show some of the things that we've been seeing in the wild? And Yeah, one thing I was going to mention when you guys were talking about domain aging, you can see yeah. on this slide, like this IRS gov was first seen in 2015, all the way at the bottom. So yeah. these threat actors are kind of leveraging these right. already aged domains um, and oftentimes, like if they spin up a new domain and try and attack, it's going to be blocked because of its category on the web, right? But these aged yeah. domains don't often get blocked by threat intel tools. So it's a, definitely a different little tactic that we've seen there. It's it, very interesting. It also causes us to do a little bit of a wild goose chase and red herrings on old threat intel, right? Yep. So if that domain has been used in the past um, for a different threat actor, you know, we we will attribute that to something old, right? right. Not a brand new campaign. And yep. it just took us a minute to say, oh, wait a minute. They're using some of these domains that may yeah. have been used in malicious campaigns in the past right? for something that's happening right now. Yeah. Yeah. So if you guys are interested in learning more, we have the full uh, kind of threat report that got passed around. It's not too long, well, like four or five pages yeah. or so, but it really steps through, you know, what happened, how did it happen? What were they doing? The patterns that we saw, super interesting read. Um, well, at least we think so, but we'll leave it up to you guys. And then, Brent, do you want to talk more on kind of what we're seeing in the wild here with PowerShell? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what we've noticed and what I've noticed in the past coming from different security roles is um, a common kind of issue or theme I've seen is um, that sort of lack of visibility uh, and available logging that adequately, adequately is showing what an attacker is doing when they're using PowerShell, right? So most tools are picking up on um, command line parameters. PowerShell is a bit different because it can be uh, used in a variety of ways, right? You can execute PowerShell via a script. You can use the command prompt, uh, whether it be in clear text or encoded. Um, you can also execute it in an interactive user session, for example, right? So um, a lot of tools out there um, are picking up the command line details, and we're going to show you a demo in a bit but miss the other events from the scripts themselves from PowerShell directly, right? So you can think of this um, as if an adversary is, for example, executing a encoded PowerShell script or command, right? If you're collecting that script block logging visibility, you can actually see the details of that command um, in its raw form, right? Without having to decode it, without having to chase down what's happening, that script block visibility is giving you that data in the raw form. And I know this slide is a bit hard to see, but if you look all the way on the right, um, that's an example of a script block type of visibility that you will not see from the command line. So the second level, the second one right there in the middle is all the command lines we're collecting. But we, what you see would be missing is that script block visibility. And we can see that in our logs here. Um, so oftentimes, uh, if you wanna kind of bypass security controls, um, you can kind of do things within um, that kind of user session or the PowerShell shell session um, to bypass those static kind of uh, script-based kind of PowerShell logging on the command line detections. And we've done a lot of work on increasing our visibility around script block logging. You can see a bunch of uh, new detections we've created at the bottom there. So essentially what you'll be able to see in these script blocks is these API calls, these Win32 API commands that they're abusing within the script to execute code on the machine. So um, it's pretty granular visibility and um, definitely uh, invaluable, I'd say, for security teams um, yeah. for this visibility. But I'm going to show you something that takes advantage of script block logging, uh, bypassing security controls, not really dropping anything malicious on disk. 
Um, so I can shoot right into a demo um, right now, so unless we, we have some that, questions. Brian, yep. Could, could we just talk a little bit? So what what is the actor using PowerShell to do here? Like, what's what's the story of what we're looking at? Yeah, so essentially they'll have a, uh, they'll be hosting like a uh, malicious file. It doesn't have to be a binary. It's just a, just a regular file type. It could be, it could be anything, right? And essentially what they're doing is they'll pull down the file, but they'll utilize script locks to bypass something like um, AMSI, which is the anti-malware scanning interface by Microsoft. So that is Microsoft's kind of first layer of malware kind of prevention, right? So um, there's a ton of bypasses, AMSI bypasses out there. This this script we're seeing here actually leverages one of them. So all on the far, far right is actually an AMSI bypass. So they're trying to get around the security con controls basically to remain either unseen if they're not collecting script block logs, they'll never see these commands executing or bypass the security controls within um, an organization that they may have in place, such as um, Defender, or AMSI, or, or something like that. So on the on the blue team side, why this is relevant is because we've evolved to kind of detect those encoded PowerShell commands, right? Um, and they look suspicious, right? Sure. But there might be legitimate reasons why you're using encoded PowerShell on on your network. So, you know, there's a lot of wild goose chases when it comes to PowerShell, um, especially since you know, Microsoft Active Directory environments can be so heterogeneous that, right. you know, someone might be using PowerShell to automate configurations. Sure. And it just sure. looks weird. So it, send us, it sends us on the blue team side down wild goose chases. Right. Um, so that's number one. And, and then we started detecting that, looking at decoding PowerShell. Um, but what Brent is talking about is going a step further right. and using PowerShell uh, on that third column yeah. uh, to actually bypass the initial command line detections that we do for, for malicious PowerShell. That's really and, interesting. And this is part of what my team on the MXDR team is set to investigate. So we have to be familiar with these different techniques. What is a normal, you know, like Patrick said, an operational PowerShell script versus what is an attempt to bypass or circumvent controls and, and perform malicious behavior. So this is a, a real world example of things that we see quite often. You know, we're in the weeds a bit here, right? So just pulling it back, 10,000 foot view, right? Different tactics that we're seeing, different delivery, right, strategies. What are we seeing from the perspective of ransomware, business email compromise, any trends, you know, at, at a higher level that are interesting? I mean, and Aaron, I know you're, you're dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis too, from the MXDR side of things. Yeah, absolutely. So from my perspective, um, especially I come from a long background of uh, incident response, specifically around ransomware negotiation, payment and recovery. Um, you know, if you asked me this about a year or two ago, um, you know, I'd say ransomware is on the rise. Not only are the demands getting higher, but, um, you know, it's, it's, there's more uh, various different threat groups out there. But what I'm actually seeing more and more of, especially with the visibility through total and, and the alerting that we, we see is actually um, a rise in business email compromise. Um, so business email compromise is uh, essentially uh, obtaining credentials for a legitimate email account and then doing a number of different things. Uh, sometimes it's sending phishing emails to um, to try and trick users into uh, sending uh, or provide more credentials or fraud or different types of activities like this. Um, another another set is actually using it to impersonate employees to try and perform wire transfers and, and other really malicious behaviors. So what I'm seeing is a significant uptick in business email compromise and actually a slight drop in ransomware behavior. Um, so uh, I believe we have a slide to, to kind of show through some of that. But, um, you know, when we're trending ransomware uh, over the last year or two, um, what we're seeing is that it's it's actually kind of, um, you know, halfway through uh, 2022, uh, we had 236 million attacks versus last year we had uh, 623 million. So a little under. So I think what we're going to see is as the year's closing out, a drop, you know, slightly in ransomware. But the yeah. uptick in, in business email compromise is significant. Um, over the last three years, uh, the total amount of money uh, being spent uh, as a result of uh, victim losses has increased over 65%, uh, being last year at over $43 billion. So significant amounts, um, uh, and they're getting more and more clever. Um, the another thing that I think is really interesting here is when it comes to ransomware, um, what they're also, or what we're starting to see as well, 
is uh, a lack of actual ransom encryption. So the attackers getting on the system mm -hmm. where they would normally deploy a ransomware, what they're doing is exfiltrating a significant amount of sensitive corporate data um, and using that for extortion um, where, rather than bothering with the ransomware part. Um, what a lot of people don't know is if you do pay a ransom in a ransomware situation, the recovery process is not only incredibly timely, um, but it requires a lot of support. Uh, you have to rebuild all the systems. You have to have double the disk space to recover. And oftentimes it, yeah. and this sounds funny, but it requires a significant amount of support, I'm using air quotes here, uh, from the threat actor themselves. So what they're doing is migrating away from having to do that um, and actually just exfiltrating data and extorting people in that regard. Um, so business email compromise on the rise, data exfiltration on the rise, ransomware starting to get a little more stagnant. Yeah, that's interesting. Why? Right. Like, what's the thinking behind it? Do we have a hypothesis of why why this is happening here? Yeah, I mean, my my opinion is that I think the idea of just not paying the ransomware and restoring from backup became a, a bit of a ubiquitous okay. thing, right? Um, the rise of cyber insurance coming down. You know, it's not just the big banks right. that have it now. It's it's coming down to small and medium businesses. Yes. Yeah. Say, you know, our insurance will pay the ransom potentially. Sure. Um, you know, things like that. So, you know, those tactics won't work. Okay. And then uh, two years from now, once we forget about it, there'll be a new ransomware campaign that has sure. a different type of TTP. Do, do you think it's also, Aaron, curious on your thoughts, do you think it's because controls against ransomware are getting more effective too? I do, yeah, I think that there is a barrier to entry when it comes to ransomware. There are some really effective mechanisms that, um, you know, the former group Conti, for example, had really good uh, methods of bypassing EDR and security and able to run. But a lot of, you know, they were a professional organization with hundreds of victims, if not thousands of victims. A lot of these smaller ransomware groups um, are going to have a hard time uh, trying to provide that level of uh, capability, especially when it comes to ransomware as a service, uh, which right. is really, really popular, um, where essentially yeah. if you hire a ransomware group to target organizations and you keep a fraction of the ransom paid. Yeah, I mean, as it becomes more commoditized, right, the, the controls are going to be able to block a commoditized attack are going to become more effective, right? So it's almost like death through success, if you will, yeah. right, as they continue to scale it. Just thinking about the business economics of how it all works, right, there's incentives to scale it. However, then, you know, the efficacy of what they're scaling decreases over time. So that's probably what we see is that peak and then like a sudden drop as, you know, just in the broader, you know, both from crime groups, from, you know, nation state groups. They're changing their tactics a bit. But Aaron, what you said was very interesting too, right? Because you mentioned that it's, you know, the ransomware aspect, it's more about the data exfiltration aspect of it versus just, you know, the encryption side of things, which could be indicative that the controls detecting the encryption are becoming more effective and they've been able to monetize more of the data exfiltration aspect of it, right? Absolutely. Agreed. Yeah, cool. Okay. Well, Brent, it looks like you're 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 back here. Um I'm back. should we give it another go? Let's try it. Let's try it. I'm very excited about this. We already <laughs> got a question about the Lenovo security update. So I'm I'm not gonna steal Brent's thunder. Let's see if we can we can get his uh many VMs going here in the Zoom share mode. While that's loading, I'll just add in one other thing <laughs> that's kind of interesting. Um yeah. you know, when it comes to business email compromise, since we said that there is an uptick in that. Um, it, it's not just exclusive to, you know, fraud. What they're also doing is taking those email credentials and going into SharePoint, going into OneDrive and yeah. the other access they have and stealing data that way. In uh, in some cases, they're doing, uh, they're overriding the files that are in SharePoint um, sure. and then basically dropping an extortion note as well. Um, so there is a lot of, uh, you know, evolution in the process and what they're doing. Like you said, they're, they're working smarter, not harder. And um, yeah, getting the data out seems to be the easier part than, you know, running these encryption, finding the backups and destroying them. Yeah, and there's been an interesting trend, too. I, I think, Aaron, do, you, do we pass the kind of Intel report on the employee impersonation and how that ties in with business email compromise to MXDR customers yesterday? But, Patrick, do you want to talk on that? Because there, there's been an increase just in media outlets, but then also just what we've seen throughout the threat landscape where employee impersonation using technology similar to deep fakes in yeah. order to redirect wires and things like that. And listen, I mean, that's going to be highly effective, right? So that comes down to almost a attacking the administrative controls aspect of it, right? The processes of the finance team and things like that versus more of like a, a security control, right? From a technical control, I should say. So yeah. you want to talk through that a little bit more? Absolutely. I mean, 
targeting folks in a finance org in a large org is is pretty easy at this point. Um, you know, everyone puts everything they work on in LinkedIn. <laughs> so you know what software they have, you know what connections they have. It's really easy to socially engineer. Right. And if you add in the the technology ability to do a, v, a deep fake voice or a deep fake video okay. of someone they trust, you're you're exploiting that that trust mechanism right yeah. out of the box. So it it kind of bypasses the traditional kind of phishing, something feels off about this, right? right. Or a smishing attack where, yeah. you know, someone sends you a text message out of the blue that you never expected. Sure. sure. Um, these are these are targeted attacks that will impersonate someone you trust and 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 take that a step farther. Right. And, and how common is this? Like, what are you guys seeing? Like, would you say this is common? Would you say that this is like an evolving tactic? Is this been successful? Like, what are we seeing right now? Definitely evolving. Um, so yeah. I wouldn't say it's common yet. Um, the amount of effort to uh, perform those types of attacks is pretty significant. So they're targeting, you know, very large organizations and, and um, you know, high profile accounts. But um, as these technologies become easier to do, for example, you can generate a, a deep fake on your own on your own computer. It just takes time. Um, so as these resources become easier to do and the, the machine learning models become easier to train, it's going to become more, uh, more and more prevalent. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we just got a question in, Aaron, if you want to answer this. You know, it was like, how is Total tackling email security? So from the MXDR standpoint, right, how do you think about that, Aaron? Yeah, absolutely. So what I always say, and uh, anyone that's uh, any of our partners that are MXDR are going to hear me uh, repeat something I say all the time, <laughs> visibility is key. Um, the more visibility we have, the more data we can actually use for context in an in incident, the better. And so email compromise, like I said, is, is on the rise. The ability for you to take your Office 365 tenants and ship off that event data into the total platform um, really gives us an incredible amount of power. So beyond the basic being able to alert on suspicious behavior, which is uh, absolutely critical, we can obviously alert on you know things like rare logon locations and um, spike in downloads of files, inbox rules, things like that. All of those you would expect from an email security. But beyond that, what we can also do is provide a, an incredible amount of detail if there was an incident. So I have a number of, of incidents every month that we handle. Um, in some cases, it might be a user that didn't have MFA turned on or something along those lines. The point is when there is a compromise, because there, you know, it's not when, it's if, or it's not if, it's when, of course. Um, when that happens, the ability to go into the total platform and export all of the events that did occur to be able to reconstruct the activities of a threat actor to say, okay, well, they accessed these files in SharePoint, they logged into this account, they tried to delegate mailbox rights. Being able to reconstruct that saves an incredible amount of time and money as well um, if there is an incident because um, where it used to be, you had to consider the entire mailbox and all uh, artifacts within it compromised. Now we can actually narrow it down to specific activities and make it easier to really understand. Um, you know, beyond that, um, you know, the ability to uh, you know leverage different types of uh, components like EDR to uh, to block malicious attachments. Um, you know, the iced ID and and other behaviors that we're seeing. Um, there's some really interesting things like Quackbot that they send a zip file and an email attachment. That zip file has an ISO attachment. And for some reason, users are opening that ISO and launching yeah. malware. So the ability be, to go beyond just the events in Microsoft's uh, Office 365, but then sure. also go to the endpoint itself and, and look at those artifacts is critical as well. Yeah, and just the prevention controls in the SGN itself, right? From, you know, again, whether it's DNS, whether it's at IP, whether it's at, you know, host name, whether it's, you know, going to a specific URL, SSL certificate, just the, the depth of the controls in that um, across the SGN are very effective at prevention also, right? So downloads get scanned. I know there's, you know, numerous times a day, Aaron, you're, you're seeing preventions, right, for potential ransomware blocks and, and things like that. So, you know, long story short, uh, brand, it looks like a system's working. So I don't want to wait too long and, and no, potentially not, jeopardize it. So <laughs> let's yeah. we'll strike by the iron hot here, Brian. <laughs> apologize, guys. Had to kill some programs and yeah. Um, but yeah, so um as we've been talking about uh living off the land, PowerShell, I'm gonna show a sample kind of attack here. Uh, I'm not gonna drop a malicious binary, um, not gonna inject into memory. Um, I'm just going to run a simple kind of obfuscate my script, chunk it up in multiple different files and show how a threat actor could target an organization um, and get access to a victim's computer. So 
Um, what you're seeing on my screen here on the left here is a Windows 11 box. It's my victim machine. On the right here is my attacker machine. Um, so I'll talk about the, the victim perspective first. So um, essentially what we did, we came up with this pretext where we're kind of acting as uh, an MSSP and we're sending an email to one of our partners saying, hey, uh, we need you to run these Lenovo security updates. Um, we've been notified. Um, our team has attempted to install these for you. However, it's been failing on your systems. So in order to stay compliant and avoid potential compromise of um, your partner systems, then please uh, please run this attached script that we have here, right? So um, we took a real copy of an, a Lenovo email, um, made kind of like a fake CVE, uh, specified all the models of the laptops that are effective. So um, basically, um, this can happen um, a variety of different ways. If we sent this with a non-password protected zip, since it's just kind of like a batch file, um, it went through just fine. You'll often see um, and, and just to clarify there, Brent, this went through uh, Office 365 ETP email protection. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Didn't so, get so picked up by through, anything. Right. And this was just, yeah, 9.33 a.m. Okay. So yeah. this morning you sent this through and, and O365 didn't stop it. Exactly. And typically yeah. what they're scanning for are like binary attributes or certain file extensions and things like that. So in our case, um, it's not a binary. Um, if we go ahead and download it from a victim's perspective, um, what we'll see here is this is just going to be um, a, a CMD file, essentially, which is just basically kind of like a batch script. And .CMD files aren't really scrutinized by some of these malware kind of mechanisms because they can't really, there's no real attributes of the file that they can scan. Um, so before I kick this off, I will just show you um, what, what is in that CMD file essentially and the reasons why I'm doing it this way. So essentially all it's doing is it's pulling one of my files down from my attacker machine over here. I'll go over these before I run, um, run the file. Um, but why I did it this way essentially is if you have these uh, empty string characters in here, Windows is going to concatenate that um, command line together and essentially just eliminate these string characters. But what this does do is this will break kind of static string detections, right? If you're just looking for PowerShell or something like that, when it comes through on the command line, it's going to be broken up like that. So that's one reason. Um, also, if you see, we're kind of um, messing with our case sensitivity here, right? So um, some tools will be case sensitive. And if you just change the case sensitivity in any way, then the detection will not uh, trigger. Um, so this is essentially all the um, script is doing that, that the user sees on their perspective if they opened it up. Um, so before I run this, let me just show you um, how we've kind of utilized PowerShell and, and um, we kind of chunked this exploit up into three different files, which makes it much harder to detect versus having one large file with all these encoded commands. Um, so essentially um, what we did is we took a legitimate uh, Lenovo kind of BIOS utility and just saw what it, um, what it listed on the screen when you ran it, right? So the first part of our kind of exploit isn't really doing anything but just echoing out the same exact commands that the Lenovo BIOS utility um, displays, right? Um, so then we have two different variables. We have A1 and R1. Um, A1 is similar to what we saw in our PowerShell screenshot before, where this is just essentially um, an AMSI bypass, right? Um, so there's, there's several bypasses online. Um, we honestly just took one of them that was online, didn't do anything kind of custom here. Um, but this is essentially what an AMSI bypass would look like. And you will not see this if you're not tracking a uh, script block logging. So this is just kind of an example of what an attacker could do to bypass some of that um, command line visibility that you have. Um, so basically we have that in base64 encoded and we have R1, which is essentially our reverse shell kind of callback, right? Um, 
So when we looked at this, um, let me open that, this up one more time. And it's essentially calling back to our victim machine and um, pulling down. Um, it's just basically doing a reverse show. And this is obfuscated a bit as well. So this is essentially the IP of my victim machine or my attacker machine I'm on. And this is the port. Um, so when we run the uh, malicious update script, then the attacker will be sitting here listening um, on that on that port waiting for your callback. Um, so just to finish off the, the script here, um, we go through the whole echo commands. Uh, we got it base64 encoded. So basically this is just pulling down two additional files. Um, once it says update process completed on the screen for the victim, um, it's going to decode um, our base64 encoded uh, parameter and pull down our files. And essentially, it's going to then be living within a PowerShell thread, right? The victim is not going to see anything on their screen. They'll have no idea that um, the attacker is living within that thread. So let's just take a look um, at what this looks like. So we sent our email, it bypassed all the filters. It's a the CMD. anticipation is killing us here, Brent. I know, Let's I got to go through action. it all. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, like Patrick said before, uh, Iced ID and threat actors will sometimes sign their binaries, right? Or sign their kind of um, their files. I did not sign this one, which is why I'm getting that. Um, but essentially, here's what it'll look like. Uh, we see we detected it um, already. And it's going through what would appear to be kind of a, that BIOS kind of flash utility that uh, Lenovo um, would do and and we'll wait here and as soon as it finishes we'll see the reverse shell callback on my um, attack machine here yeah so a couple of things to point out here this isn't using any kind of advanced hacker tools this isn't right. this isn't metasploit this isn't mimicats this isn't Empire shell you know, Brent's exactly. using cat to listen, yep. and he's using a command a command shell to to pop PowerShell on 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 the uh, victim machine. So it's it's really truly living off the land, and, and it's effective, exactly. right? So it bypassed ATP, bypassed everything, and you know this is why it's part of the 2023 predictions, right? This is why Aaron's team is spending a lot more time, you know, kind of making sure that they're you know, going through all of this, right? Brent's building a lot of detections. That's why it popped up, but it, it's it's our thinking that there's going to be a sharp increase. In these types of attacks um, going forward. Yeah. So Brent, or, or, so you're one, in now. Yeah, one thing I'd like to mention is like what Patrick was talking about, like there's so many detections and signatures around Metasploit and Cobalt Strike and Iodine and all these different attack tools and what their IOCs are, right? Right now, we're kind of, what he said, we're doing it without any of those tools. This is just very simple stuff, like living off the land. You can see on my um, victim machine over here. Here's PowerShell right here. They see no PowerShell on their system. They're just telling their tech support team that, hey, uh, we updated it. It says it was uh, completed successfully. Now we can see on my victim machine, I have a shell um, to their system. They don't know I'm running commands on the back end. So I can look in their directory. I can see all the files they have. I could exfil some files. I could say, um, net user, this username is user in this case, we can say, okay, this guy is a member of the admin group. Well, that's, now I have all access I need to do kind of anything I want on that PC. And they have no idea that I'm living in PowerShell right now. Um, so it's very scary. It's what we see. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's tough to find attacks like this unless you have the proper visibility. And that's what we've been working really hard on and building out detections for this type of stuff as well. Um, and this was just in detect mode, but obviously, if I switched it to prevent, I would it would we would kill it immediately. Uh, when I tested it this morning, uh, Windows Defender did not pick this up. So Windows Defender is not kind of catching uh, this type of uh, attack right now. Um, and we'll catch it with our malicious behavior module because the behavior is malicious. But for Defender and other things that are just looking for malware, there's no malware dropped in this sample. So that's why a lot of tools will not will not detect this. So it's it's something very powerful, and this is what we look out for um, all the time for our partners. Yeah, that's you know, awesome. it, 
it's yeah. pretty funny, Brent, because as you're going through this, I'm thinking in the back of my head all the different ways that we would see this and we detect this and uh, based on all the alerts that my team investigates. So it's funny you ran net user. Well, if you do that a, a couple of times, that's going to trigger a threshold. Your yeah. encoded PowerShell commands trigger an alert. Um, so I'm just kind of going through my head of all the different things that uh, the alarms you're setting off even though this is living off the land and, you know, for most people blending into day-to-day -day activity, um, it, it's a great way to make sure that we have that visibility and we can adequately investigate these types of things. Yeah, even the download string parameters, which aren't used often, we'll get that regardless of casing. We don't care about case sensitivity in our rules. Uh, none of that matters as far as um, kind of that obfuscation that doesn't matter to us either. Um, we have ways to detect this stuff um, without some of these bypasses, but but yeah, it's, it's kind of fun to show um, how someone could leverage this. And um, this was just put together fairly quickly. If you think about a threat actor or an adversary, right? Who has all the time, all the resources, they can get a lookalike domain, they can test sending their scripts through email filters. If that doesn't work, they can zip up and password protector zip file, they can, if that doesn't work, they can yeah. kind of use a uh, a link to point you to something to download. So there's all kinds of ways to get past of this stuff and more encoding that we could do here. But this is just a sample that easily bypasses Defender without dropping kind of malware on the system. Yeah, so two 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 really good points there, Brent. Um, number one, the adversaries know what tools we're using, right? They have their own CrowdStrike licenses and labs they have their own palo alto licenses and yep. labs and they're they're constantly testing their tools against those systems and you know number two behavior is key right, right. just looking at static uh, signatures and and static capabilities really doesn't do it anymore we have to look at the behaviors on the system yeah. and you really can't do that with traditional mechanisms at this point yeah, absolutely. And that, that was a great example. Thanks, Brent. Just, you know, for full transparency, I said, Brent, you have 24 hours to bypass Defender, <laughs> time boxed, and this is what he came up with. So great work in a very, very short amount of time. But let's talk supply chain, right? Supply chain attacks, huge last year, very big this year. What are our thoughts going into 2023? Um, Patrick, from, from your side, what are you seeing? What are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, you could see the the RCE that was released for ConnectWise uh, was a big deal. Um, you know, that phishing attack that happened within the last 24 hours against ConnectWise customers. Yeah. Um, so what is, is this? What are we looking is a at big here? deal. So this is this is actually you know not not only are, are we tracking from a from a blue team perspective um, the vulnerabilities that are out there, making sure we patch. Right. You know, the traditional kind of 101 of security um you know this is a russian hacker site that that publicized the fact that there's there's a cve against connectwise and here's some things you can do um to to exploit it right so you know they're looking at the tools we use to automate you know powershell is one example right um ConnectWise, some of the RMM tools, yeah. you know, those are going to continue to be targets, right? Um, SolarWinds was just the tip of the iceberg, right? With with SaaS, there's less visibility. Yep. Um, that's what's been frustrating for me coming from a traditional kind of network background, investigate every packet, look at P, if PCAPs or it didn't happen, right, back right. in the day. Sure. But, you know, if you're using Okta or Azure AD, good luck trying to get a PCAP from a SaaS product, right? right. So, you know, making sure that we really have that visibility and as many logs as we can coming into the sim to, yeah. to number one, detect to near real time, right. and number two, to be able to get a full picture of what happened sure. if an attacker does use, you know, a, a, a token vulnerability like we saw with, with Okta last year. Yeah, absolutely. So we covered a lot today, right, of, you know, what we think is going to be coming up. So we talked about employee impersonation for the business email compromise. We talked on PowerShell. We talked on the domain aging patterns. We talked on the sophistication of the ICE ID, right? We talked on a number of different things. So well, let's talk a little bit about what are we doing about it, right? So we'd love to hear just going around real quick, you know, Brent, how are you thinking about, you know, adding in additional detect detections? Aaron, how are you, you know, ensuring that your team is able to respond. Patrick, how are you spending your time on the research in Intel land? So Brent, you want to kick us off about, you know, how are we stopping this? How are we identifying it? How are we staying ahead? Yeah, absolutely. So I think I think Patrick made a good point, right? So 
if you're not collecting the data, you're lacking that visibility, you'll have no idea what's going on in your network, right? So um, endpoint logs are heavily uh, collected mostly everywhere. Um, we have a lot of preventions and detections in place, but when I think of a problem like this, I think of those third-party cloud, SaaS apps, AWS, things like that, where you may have a misconfiguration out there somewhere, uh, and that gets compromised, right? And that leads to getting inside your infrastructure without having to hit like a bypass any EDRs. Um, so yeah, so what we've been doing is we've been building out um, several different uh, integrations covering all these cloud SaaS app solutions, AWS, O365, uh, GCP, any of these firewall uh, Meraki devices. So what we do when we build out these integrations is we also test several different things, test several different tools and look for how would I as a malicious actor kind of exploit AWS infrastructure? What will the API calls look like on the back end? And how can I write detections around those APIs? Um, so right now we have uh, hundreds of detections, not just for network events, not just for um, endpoint events, but uh, a core concept is protecting your third-party cloud SaaS app solutions. And that's what our team does. We look at those API calls that are that are made and use attack tools. Um, there's an attack tool called PACU, which actually exploits AWS infrastructure that we've used to build our detections out. So we use the same tools that threat actors are using, right? Um, see what they can do with those tools and then see what uh, artifacts those tools leave. And then that's how we kind of build our detections around that. Um, and we have a lot of data um, that we can so sort through and test like noise levels, what's a noisy API, what's not a noisy API, how can I abuse this? So yeah, my team is heavily focused on endpoint network, but those third-party um, SaaS apps and protecting our partners in one kind of central uh, location. That's great. And, and Aaron, just in addition to, to, to what you're doing, we're getting a lot of questions here. We're going to try to answer all of them. But if you could just cover, you know, if there is a compromise, what should a partner do as well, right? So what are those steps? Walk us through that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when it comes to an incident, timeliness and response is absolutely critical. Um, if you have a cyber liability insurance carrier, it's certainly very important to notify them right away. Um, they're going to help invoke, you know, an incident response plan. Um, you know, as far as that goes, making sure a third party IR provider is able to help collect and manage that evidence. Um, you know, if you are a total MXDR partner, um, you know, our team will walk you through what that process looks like, as well as, you know, export and provide you with all the relevant details in the meantime. Um, so that way you're aware of what's happening, what kind of mitigation steps you can take. Um, but really the concept is uh, if you have cyber liability insurance, you want to make sure you notify them right away. Um, from there, you want to focus on containment and understanding the breadth of the incident. You know, how far did this go? Is it limited to a certain host or set of users? Um, and what that exposure is. Um, it's also really important, and this is where, you know, insurance carriers can be really helpful, is making sure that, you know, liability is covered as well. So um, if you do have liability insurance, they're going to uh, invoke what's called a breach coach, uh, which is a fancy name for lawyer, that's going to kind of walk you through and make sure that you're meeting all of your um, compliance requirements. So depending on your state, you might have timelines that you have to meet in order to notify um, either uh, third-party counsels or uh, actual, um, you know, victims themselves of these types of activities. So strongly suggest that. Um, in addition to that, you know, with, with my team, if you don't have cyber liability insurance, MXDR is a great way to make sure you're getting those recommendations and, um, you know, following uh, the guidance of our team who are all very well versed in incident response. So making sure that, you know, you, you get those recommendations uh, to close out any type of uh, potential security hole that's there. Aaron used to have ransomware threat actors leaving him voicemails to negotiate payments. So he is so deep into this world. It's just amazing to have him on our team. Aaron, how are you spending your time? Um, you know, let's look ahead to 2023 here. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're constantly looking at how we can raise visibility within the platform. So as Brent was saying, with those SaaS applications, uh, we meet with our, our MXDR partners uh, regularly and start talking about what tools and technologies they're leveraging and how we can build those integrations out to get that data in. Uh, beyond that, constantly training the team and understanding different types of attacks, as well as reviewing different incidents that have occurred um, to try and see if there are points of improvement, uh, other artifacts that we might have been able to identify and, you know, continuous improvement of our team's ability to respond. Um, that paired with 
training of our partners and with the MXDR service and our monthly updates, really keeping them up to date on what those threats are and putting out those threat intelligence bulletins as quick as possible. Great, thanks, Aaron. And Patrick? Yeah, I know we're running out of time here, so I'll be quick. Um, you know, the key for me from a research perspective is that the Achilles heel of the adversaries that they have to ride the same infrastructure that yeah. we do, right? So I, I I just love the data set that we have here at Total from layer two all the way up to layer seven, and then even layer seven and a half with SaaS and cloud data. So looking at that data, understanding how the adversary is using the same infrastructure as we are, um, maybe using some new tactics and techniques, you know, DNS over HTTPS is part of the Windows stack now. Right. Um, and not a lot of people know that, right? So, you know, as soon as the adversary sees something that they can turn on and, and fly under the radar, they're going to do that. So continue to do research into the data that we have and understanding what adversaries are doing, as well as looking. Uh, to the future and, and seeing what some emerging, emerging technologies are doing right. um, to, to attack uh, our customers. So yeah, look, really looking forward to digging into the data here and, and providing more value to our customers with threat reports like the ICE ID. Yeah, absolutely excellent. Looking forward to seeing a lot more of those reports too. So um, we weren't able to, to answer everyone's questions. You know, if you did have any other questions, please reach out to your account manager or sales at toll.com if you're not currently a partner. So I want to thank everyone for your time um, and we'll, we'll be doing more of these. So excited to do more of these uh, in the near future. Thanks everyone, take care.